You're listening to Quantum Conversations with Karen Curry Parker. Join us as we explore new frontiers in consciousness, science, and evolution. And now here's your host, Karen Curry Parker. People often lean towards either trusting their gut or relying on their analytical mind. But what if the powerful synthesis of your experience, soul, and personality integrated, your wisdom, gives you deeper, more aligned insights and practical solutions to the choices you need to make in your life? What if you know already how to connect to deeper, more fundamental wisdom than you realize? We sometimes forget that we're passengers in this Earth's experience. Your soul is simply occupying your life right now, a temporary experience designed with a purpose set in place by your higher wisdom. When we rely on the human experience to give us our insights and help us make decisions in our life, we are reacting to our temporary status instead of pulling from the timeless innate wisdom of our infinite selves. According to Ellen Tad, author of The Infinite View, a guidebook for life on earth, spirit is the God force that animates and empowers us and suffuses everyone and everything But while spirit is conscious and communicative, we haven't been taught to look for it or listen for it. In fact, most of us have been conditioned to not look or listen. Please join me for a powerful quantum conversation with Ellen as we discuss how you can make powerful choices in your life by learning to tune into your innate infinite wisdom. Hi, and welcome to Quantum Conversations. I'm Karen Curry Parker, and today I am excited to be having a quantum conversation with Ellen Tad. Ellen is an internationally known clairvoyant counselor who's been teaching and counseling for more than 40 years. She's widely accepted for the integrity of her work and the accuracy of her perceptions and guidance and the clarity and usefulness of her teaching. Her work has been supported by the Edgar Cayce Foundation, the Marion Institute, Deepak Chopra, Child Spirit Institute, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and the Boston Center for Adult Education, among others. Her work has also been covered in Newsweek, and Tad has lectured across the country at colleges, universities, hospitals, and community groups. Ellen's first bet book, Death and Letting Go, appeared on the Boston Globe bestseller list, and we're going to be here talking to her today about her new book called The Infinite View, A Guidebook for Life on Earth. I love this title. <laughs> Welcome, Ellen. <laughs> it's so wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Karen. It's it's great to be with you. So I, re- I was reading this book on the plane, and I was very rarely have this experience. But as I was reading, the guy next to me was totally into the book and was like impatient with me if I was flipping the pages faster than he was going through, which I think is a really powerful testament to this book because as it turned out later, I found out he's an engineer. Um, and definitely, you know, one of those types, you talk about the two types of people, one of those types of people who I think has been deeply trained to rely on his intellect to make decisions about life. So I want to talk to you first and foremost about the the beginning of this book where you sort of set us up to understand the two types of ways of knowing. Can you tell us a little bit about those two types of ways of knowing and how you can support us in the skills and the information that you share with finding a better way to unify our heart and our mind or our knowing and our intellect. Yes. Well, um, you know, I, I felt very fortunate that I was raised by my father who was a physicist because I grew up being raised by a very brilliant person, but I, learned very early that just because you have a developed intellect doesn't mean you make wise decisions because he made a lot of poor decisions. So I, you know, I was always searching and my book really does illustrate my, my journey, but I learned uh, through my own process that deep focus and deep listening are the two fundamental skills to access what I call attunement or our deeper wisdom. And you can call meditation the process of developing the skill of deep listening, which is then applicable 
in day-to-day living, but also in a time of meditation, which I think of as going in the closet and closing the door and being fully with our own spirit, fully with our our uh, deepest, most enlightened self. And the other is the skill of the activating the third eye chakra, which is the center of focus and concentration. It's the center of wisdom and it's the center of discernment. And in sports, they talk about the zone. And I was actually just reading Tom Brady's new book last night, and he talks about the experience of being in the zone. And when an athlete is in the zone, they are actually focusing the third eye chakra, the the center that's in the middle of the forehead. And it's activated through focus and concentration alone. And when we're in deep focus, we become unattached to the results and move deeper than that to be able to actualize our best selves and to make wise decisions. So I, I've worked with large numbers of people, helping them to focus out of the middle of their forehead. And I always say, when you open two eyes, open three, open your physical eyes and focus simultaneously out of the middle of your forehead. How silly that sounds, but it's very, very effective. It's very powerful. I've been practicing. (laughs) So so I I, want to talk about this because, you know, one of the things we talk a lot about on Quantum Conversations is how do we stay aligned or attuned, as you say, um, in this cycle of huge upheaval? We have polarized energy. We have so much emotional stuff going on. We have even people who I think are attempting to be spiritually aligned, taking to the streets with great emotional energy. We have you know, this, this interesting cycle of disruption that we're in, we have fake news, right? Everything, you know, you have to kind of evaluate everything you read yeah. at this point. And How all the can, disagree. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you talk about listening deeply. How can somebody listen deeply or learn to listen deeply better in the midst of all of this disruption? Well, it's, it's kind of like, going to the gym and building up your muscles. Then when you have to move furniture in your house, you have stronger muscles so that you can use those stronger muscles in your everyday life. The skill of meditation is a skill that deepens one's ability to listen, which is then practical and can be used in everyday life. But I also want to stress uh, the third eye because I decided to clairvoyantly watch chakras and I did that for a couple of decades and I was interested in the chakras because I wanted to understand human behavior. I wanted to understand why people do what they do. And I found that the chakra system is a framework for understanding human behavior. It's, it's a succinct and powerful tool. Just like our organs have a purpose, each chakra has a purpose. And one of the fundamental things I learned through observing chakras, and you know, if you Google chakras, probably there's about 500 books written about it, and I didn't read them. I used my own natural clairvoyance to learn. I wanted to know how do they function in everyday life. And what I found was some people focus in the gut. Matter of fact, we are what I call a solar plexus dominant culture. Most people live their life while focused in the gut. And whoever came up with the phrase, follow your gut, I think made a big mistake because this is the center of emotion. This is the center of feeling. And when we live our life focused there, we follow our feelings. But our feelings are not necessarily trustworthy because feelings can come from fear. Feelings can come from clarity. Feelings can come from being overly affected by the opinions of others. So they're not necessarily clear. And this center of emotion, the gut, is not the center of perception. It's the center of feeling. The third eye in the middle of the forehead is the proper center of perception. And I like the phrase, perception informs feeling. How we perceive informs how we feel. 
And what I've found when I look at people's energy, when they're focused out of the middle of their forehead, their auras double and triple in size, they become their wisest self. I have a student who's bringing my understanding of the chakra system into schools now. And in one after school program, they have a focus corner. When kids are confused or out of balance or bullying, they go to the focus corner, they walk a balance beam or they balance a peacock feather, which takes focus. And then they change. I remember one little girl said, I can use this tool for the rest of my life because she liked herself better when she was her wise self instead of her emotionally reactionary self. And so as we're navigating this really challenging time, the third eye in the middle of the forehead is like the miner's light. It illuminates our path. And I learned this early on without knowing exactly technically what I was doing, which is that when I was giving birth to my daughter, I studied Lamaze and was told to focus on a point. And when I was focused on the pine tree outside my window, I rode the contractions of labor and didn't get frightened and didn't get overwhelmed. When I lost my focus and went back to the solar plexus, then I was frightened and overwhelmed. And I tell people that when you focus, you ride life. When you lose your focus, you get overwhelmed by it. So the fact that we are in challenging times, focus and concentration is one of the most important skills we can develop. And it really is a muscle that everyone can build. So do you have a particular form of meditation that you recommend to support people in awakening their third eye and being able to harness that focus? Well, yes. So there's the meditation I teach, which is in my book, The Infinite View, And then there's a technique I teach that, so that meditation helps to develop deep listening. And then a technique that I teach, which my friend now calls the TAD technique, is comparison of the perception. Like, for example, I'll tell someone to close their eyes, focus in the gut, imagine you're late for an important appointment. What do you feel and what do you do? And then bring your focus up to the point in the middle of your forehead, like an elevator, envision a round window, focus out of your forehead, imagine the same scenario that you're late for an important appointment and compare the difference. People go from rushed and anxious to calm and centered. And it's just a pivot away. How we focus informs how we perceive and how we feel. Because when someone brings their focus up to the third eye, they get perspective. They see that in the scheme of life, being late for an appointment is not a big deal. And you can then do this with your eyes opened, which is paying (laughs) attention to how you're focused throughout the day. And I tell people stare at points, the corner of a picture frame, the end of a branch, the process of focusing just in that simple aspect, no matter what you're focused on, will help you make wiser decisions and prevent you from being in reaction when things are not ideal. Beautiful. So you, you are a medium. And you, I think, awakened to a lot of your own understanding starting at a very young age, connecting with your deceased mother who said to you, no matter how things appear on the surface, if you look deep enough, you will see there are always reasons and justice. Talk to me about how people can connect to that sense of reason and justice when they are so emotionally caught up in what they feel is the injustice of what's going on right now. Well, there's some fundamentals that impact my philosophy, such as we are all spirit temporarily on the earth. Because of my clairvoyance, I was able to meet my children before they were born. And I talk about the story of watching my son incarnate. So I met him before he was born. I watched him drop his etheric body and then come into the physical and then be a baby, and now he's an adult. 
And so I have a perspective that we all come to the earth for a reason. We all come to learn, we all come to contribute, and we all come to enjoy. I see life on the earth as a school. And so the fundamental question is, why am I here? What am I here to learn? What am I here to contribute? Rather than a materialistic perspective, which is we are just, um, you know, a product of our parents, what influences our personalities, our genetics, and our environment. And then the question is, how do I make life be what I want it to be? How do I get what I want? Well, it's a totally different emphasis. And because I've had direct experiences, which is the number one thing I'd like to facilitate for my students, direct experience, so they can not believe me, but have their own authority. So the other piece is I do believe in reincarnation because I've seen it. And, you know, something as simple as, you know, seeing my son had a lot of past lives in China, and now what was he attracted to? He was attracted to China, and now he lives in Beijing. So oh, wow. I see that the story of our past lives informs our interests, informs our fears, informs our attraction and relationships. So it's recognizing, yes, the earth is in turmoil, but the reason is because people have been disconnected from fundamental principles that hold life together. And so nature is rebelling and saying this is not living in balance. This is not living in an interconnected consciousness. And there are ramifications to our actions. So how do you think this is going to end up? <laughs> well, so my number one commitment is to growth and raising my own consciousness and inspiring others to do the same, to experience the sense of fulfillment from actualizing my best and to inspire others to actualize their best. So whether our planet survives or not, to me, is not the most important thing, even though I think we probably have one of the most beautiful planets in the universe, because it is a beautiful place and shouldn't be taken for granted. I still believe that when we die, because I've talked to people who have died and that we take our consciousness with us, that's the part we take with us. And when consciousness becomes more uh, respectful of the creative gift of life, we treat each other better. We treat the earth better. And what I love about understanding reincarnation is really no one gets away with anything. If someone is, <laughs> is greedy or selfish. I, I love the phrase, life keeps an accurate scorecard. So in that way, you see, uh, all we can do is our best. We cannot control, but we can be positive influences. Beautiful. Beautifully said. So is there anything else you'd like to add in closing about how people can stay centered and connected to the listening and the focus as they create in their day lives? Do you have a last message for us before we, we go back out there and deal with it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to quote my son. When he was in high school and I taught him how to use his third eye, he said, when you live life in the solar plexus, you experience the human condition from the human perspective, and it's a tragedy. When you live life focused out of the middle of your forehead, you experience the human condition from a spiritual perspective, and it's really interesting. And I think that kind of sums it up. It, it, he didn't say, oh, it's easy, but it's so interesting because there's lessons and there's meaning and there's purpose and there's interconnection. And when we look deeper, then it's not so much about controlling things so we get what we want. It's really riding life. You know, we can't hammer it flat. It's going to be up and down. It's riding it and it's understanding, you know, why is this happening to me? What am I to learn? How do I 
rise to the occasion so that I become a positive contributor instead of just being in reaction to things being difficult. You know, it's really, um, it's really a time at a spiritual level where people have an opportunity to heal their souls and to transform because the challenges really offer lots of opportunity for learning. Beautifully said. Thank you. Ellen Tad, your website is ellentadd.com. And if you go there, you can learn more about Ellen's workshops and classes. And of course, about her new book, The Infinite View, a guidebook for life on earth. And Ellen's book is available on Amazon. And as I said, don't read it on the plane because your neighbor will want to read over your shoulder. So, but maybe that's part of the purpose there. <laughs> so, um, thank that's you. Thank you so much. No, not at all. Not at all. So I really appreciate you for, and then thank you so much for joining us today and for, thank you for sharing what I think is just this really simple, practical thing. You know, sometimes we have these, we, I think sometimes the mind wants to create these very complex systems of connecting and ascending and you just keep it so beautifully simple. And I really appreciate that. I think that helps in the midst of all of this to just say, okay, I'm going to look I'm going to look out my third eye and see what's up. So I appreciate you so much. And thank you for joining us today for Quantum Conversations. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. There are two kinds of creativity. Situational creativity, which is the kind of creativity we're trained to use on this planet. It's reasonable, confined to what we think is possible, reactive, and based on our past experiences and our current emotions. Because of this, it's somewhat finite and limited. The second kind of creativity is called fundamental creativity. There are several aspects to this different kind of creativity. Fundamental creativity transcends your conditioning. It usually arrives in the form of an epiphany, the aha moment, if you will. Fundamental creativity comes from the quantum field and is unlimited by our finite minds. It is imaginative and possibility-oriented, and it allies with cosmic order. In other words, it's aligned with love, and it is also unreasonable. Fundamental creativity has given us things like electricity, the capacity to go to the moon, combustion engines, and more. We are designed to tap into evolutionary fundamental creativity. It's our nature and part of our hardwiring. But our training in life has taught us to experience creativity only within the limits of what we think is possible and that if we want to create something new, we have to figure it out. When you learn to tap into your real wisdom, that awareness that connects you to your place in the cosmos and not just your earth-based life, you tap into deeper levels of creativity that hold the promise to not only make your life better, more alive and more vital, but may actually hold the key to consciously evolving our world. If you'd like to discover your unique way to tap into your natural wisdom and your quantum creativity, please visit my Quantum Conversations Facebook page. And while you're there, get your free human design chart and discover deeper insights into how you can choose your direction in life with deeper wisdom. Leave us a note and let us know who else you might like to have on a quantum conversation. I'm Karen Curry Parker, reminding you that every moment of your life is an act of profound creativity. You're a creative genius. Use your powers wisely. Thanks for listening to Quantum Conversations with Karen Curry Parker. For more information, visit joyfulmission.com.